Welcome to Where I'm From, the podcast that proves no matter how far you go, you'll always keep a little piece of home with you. I'm Bill Meeks. This week's episode is a little different. I'm remembering and memorializing my longtime friend and musical collaborator Stephen Carroll from Wheeling, West Virginia. Uh, This episode uh, isn't going to have any fancy intro. We're just going to get right into it. So uh, stay tuned for a profile on a brilliant musician and a dear friend. Hey guys, I want to thank you for joining me today. This is Bill Meeks, host of Where I'm From. Uh, This is a very special episode. Um, My friend Steve, who I've collaborated with on things since I was like 14 years old, uh, got word a couple days before Christmas that uh, he he passed away. And uh, it's been hard. Um, If you're wondering why there haven't been any episodes of Where I'm From, it's because I've been dealing with it. But I thought a good way to sort of, you know, process my feelings about it and to kind of celebrate him, (laughs) a a good way would be to do an episode of where I'm from all about Steve. And it makes sense, too, because Steve's where I'm from, where I'm from, uh, which is Wheeling, West Virginia, or more technically, I guess, the Bethlehem uh, neighborhood of West Virginia. Um, I just uh, I just want to say, you know. It's been hard. Um, Steve's always been the guy who I could email with some sort of crazy project. And he was all in, man. (laughs) Like, we were even talking as recently as a couple months ago about, uh, you know, my Everly Heights project and him helping out with that. So it's, uh, again, he's been a guy I've been emailing for decades now. Anytime I had some crazy idea that might need musical support. Um, he was a genius. Uh, he was really great at technology and using technology and his art <laughs> with music and everything. But we're going to go through a lot of memories today. And uh, hopefully, um, you know, you'll get to learn a little bit about Steve at least. And uh, hopefully it'll, uh, you know, help me as I kind of process everything. So I've put together a slideshow here. Uh, so if you're watching the video version, uh, you'll get some supporting visuals uh so we put the slideshow up right here all right so i guess uh you know we'll get started here let me grab my notes yeah and this episode is going to be not edited at all completely loosey-goosey uh but i think that's kind of the way this kind of episode should go right all right okay so here we go steve carroll Okay, so I met Steve, Stephen Carroll, as his legal name was, or Steve, as I called him, in John Simonson's computer class at Wheeling Park High School. Uh, this was a computer class. It started out with like spreadsheets, then databases, then teaching you old programming languages like Fortran and COBOL. And we were both really nerdy guys, so we got along really well in the class. We also rode the same bus up to Bethlehem. He lived on the uh, hill opposite where my parents lived. And uh, since he was so involved in church stuff, sometimes my fundamentalist mom, who didn't really let me hang out with kids my own age because they were all evil, uh, she'd let me go out over there and hang out with them sometimes. So sometimes I get off the bus at Steve's house walk over to Steve's house and hang out for the afternoon. So, you know, we we were pretty close. Um, I, I'll even say that, uh, you know, in the mornings, uh, there was a back hallway at Wheeling Park High School, and it would be me and Steve and uh, Tim Anderson and Craig Burke and Brian Huff. And we would all sit back in that hallway and we would discuss things, whatever we were doing on computers at the time, whether it was a game or some new website, because websites were new then. Or we would talk about the latest Simpsons episode. I remember uh, uh, 
ongoing joke between the four or five of us was a go banana where Ralph Wiggum's like they're having a orange race down the bus that's collapsed and uh, the other kids are rolling oranges and uh, Ralph Wiggum throws a banana down and he goes go banana. Uh, I feel like I'm already rambly in this episode. I do have some organization, some notes, but uh, prepare for me to ramble a little bit because, you know, uh, it, 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 it's tough. Um, yeah, but you'll see here on your screen, this is actually, I went through Internet Archive and I found the old directory for computer technology student pages. Um, and I found me and Steve's name there. Unfortunately, those links don't go anywhere and I can't find those on archive.org. Uh, but uh, it went to our various homepages. Steve's was centered around his music because he was already into music at that time. And mine was more centered on... Well, I had an emulation page for a second, but I think my page was called Insanity Personified, where I posted my really emo uh, <laughs> poetry. You don't want to look it up. You don't want to find it. But uh, I did find this page here, which I thought was pretty cool. All right, let's see here. So as I said, me and Steve were both big nerds. Me personally... I was a computer gaming nerd. Uh, I came into that computer class with my own software company uh, making games in a game creation system called ZZT, which you'll see up here on your screen. My game was Lois and Clark, The New Adventure. It was really bad. You can find it if you want to play it. It's online. Uh, so I was that kind of nerd, sort of like a programming nerd and a writing nerd. And then Steve was a music nerd. And he loved music. He had a professional MIDI keyboard at home. Uh, he did piano lessons, recitals, all that kind of stuff. And a lot of what he did was um, he would play. Uh, well, for one, I want to say he used a program called Cakewalk to do his MIDI keyboard stuff, which was the top of the line MIDI program <laughs> back in the 90s. Uh, and uh, he mainly outside of the classical pieces he would learn for his uh, recitals and things like that. He was a really big Pink Floyd fan. So I figured I'd go ahead and pull. I did find a cover on his YouTube uh, page of him doing a Pink Floyd song. So I figured I'd play that for you guys since Steve was such a big fan. Now, Steve, uh, you know, like I said, we had that small pod of people uh, that we hung out with in the back hallway. One of those guys was Jason South. And I got a hold of him uh, a couple days ago uh, once news got out about Steve and everything. And he agreed to send me some memories about Steve. So now this first one I love. Um, it's all about how the Secret Service came to <laughs> talk to Steve at Park, all because of our computer class. Okay, so Jason says, before graduation, Steve thought it would be funny to write an insane text file in Notepad and leave it on a random computer's desktop for someone to find in Simonson's computer class. The letter was goofy and was about taking over the world and moving to the moon. Uh, someone found it real quick, LOL, and told the front office, and the front office freaked. They had someone from the Secret Service drive up to park to do some psychiatric evaluations on him him being Steve. <laughs> it was crazy. I remember because I think I had rotated out of the computer classes when all that went down. But I remember hearing about it in the hallway uh, the next morning. And yeah, and then Steve wasn't in school for a few days. We're on the bus for a few days. <laughs> it was weird. But uh, yeah, it eventually got uh, smoothed over and Steve went on to lead a very productive life. And uh, another story from Jason here. Oh, he says uh, when he got home, he watched the news out of the freak chance that it would be on the news. Uh, Steve getting approached by the Secret Service and it was on the news. Uh, so, I mean, it was a small town. Like, I think Wheeling has like 50,000 people, small WTRF news station there. Of course, they're going to go up to the high school if the Secret Service is getting involved. All right. So in the next up, 
Uh, Jason, I wanted to talk a little bit about Steve's creativity in his studio at his house, which I recorded at uh, about a billion times. So uh, Jason says, Steve was super creative. One day in the late 90s, he asked me to come over to his house to show me something he was working on. When I got there, he turned off all the lights in his basement and it literally, literally looked like we were in outer space. It was such a WTF moment. I asked him, what the hell? I asked him, what in the hell is this? He had he had thought the idea to take panels of blackout fabric and insert about a thousand fiber optic cables into the fabric, make it an illusion where you were in outer space. Ooh, I, I can just picture it in my head right now. So like this black uh, fabric with fiber optic lights run through it. And it makes the room look like it's space, right? It was crazy cool. And not to mention he would break out into the Star Wars and other sci-fi music, uh, which made it even more awesome. Because, I mean, Steve had a piano uh, right in his uh, main area in his house. So he was always willing to bust that thing out. Jason goes on. One thing that just sprung to mind, and this may be only impressive to computer nerds, LOL. I just had to check my old IM logs to verify the exact folder size. He had 90.7 gigabytes of wave samples that he used to interface with his old keyboard in the 90s. Let that sink in. LOL. In the 90s, he had 90.7 gigabytes of wave samples he had to store locally, which was no small task and I'm sure wasn't cheap back then. I think, you know, most of the consumer grade hard drives were like 100 megabytes, maybe 500 megabytes. And then Jason goes on. Uh, this again, Jason uh, repeats me. This is when hard drives were one, a one gigabyte to 10 gigabyte if you were lucky. He had so many so many computers networked together so he could access all these files. That's how he was able to have a setup that sounded so professional. Um, so I believe that's all of Jason's anecdote. Yes, I believe so. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Jason, for sending that in. Uh, it's always nice to, well, for one, I haven't talked to Jason for years and I, you know, if you can find a silver lining in uh, sad things happening, it's that it gives you a reason to reach out to some old friends. So uh, thank you very much, Jason. I was It was nice touching base with you, and I hope you enjoyed this episode uh, devoted to Steve. Okay, now me and Steve uh, used to collaborate on silly websites all the time back in my computer class. Uh, we did an emulation page together called Bill's Emulation Location. Uh, there was a Weird Al fan site that we did together. And uh, speaking of that emulation site, one time Steve helped my friend Craig make a parody version for him to bring into computer class on a diskette and show me like, ha ha, laugh. Uh, so it was Bill's emulation location. And there was a picture of Mario right on the front page of the site. Um, Mario 64. And so uh, Steve and Craig went in and they changed it to from Bill's emulation location to Bill's masturbation location. And they stripped off all of the clothes that Mario had. So he was just standing there like a little nude Italian plumber, which, you know, hilarious. Right. But they did get in trouble for that. And I got in trouble for that, too, come to think of it, because it's Bill's emulation location or other location as the case might be. Um, so, uh, yeah. And I believe I, I think, uh, I, I think me and Steve both got in school suspension for seven days for that. Not the first time or the last time I would get in school suspension because of something that happened in computer class, but those are stories for another day. And, you know, we collaborated on a lot of projects back then too anything from little programs written in pascal or fortran to little humorous little uh newsletters and things like that there was always a reason to collaborate with steve uh which which i always loved so you know me and steve were really tight there especially the first the first couple of years that friend group was really my only friend group and i had just come to high school from homeschooling so I was I needed any friend I could get. Right. And th those five guys, Tim, Jason, Craig, Steve and Brian were sort of my lifeline. Uh, but, you know, as, as you do, I grew up, things happened. I got a girlfriend. <laughs> and uh, th so then I swerved from doing computer stuff to doing theater stuff, as you see here on the screen. Um, 
I, I, I didn't talk much to Steve or any of the other guys once the theater stuff started happening. Uh, for one, my girlfriend was kind of, you know, like very controlling of my time. And then I had theater and I didn't have any time left for Steve and the nerdy guys. Uh, but, uh, you know, we chat when we saw each other, but we really didn't hang out much anymore. I think I think there were a couple times my junior year I went over to his house again off the bus, but it was few and far between. Uh, so... You know, I was doing the theater and then I got into the punk scene and wheeling for a little bit. And then I went off to college, you know, off to make my future. And I didn't know if I'd ever see Steve again. Um, but even though, you know, my college was close to wheeling where Steve lived, uh, I really never made it down much. I might have run into him like at a restaurant or something sometime, but I didn't really see him much during college. I, I will say that Steve kept busy, though. Um, he even got featured uh, for his work with MIDI and music keyboards and everything uh, by the West Virginia PBS news program Outlook, which I have a clip of right here. Technology has given musicians an upper hand. Entire compositions can be changed with the stroke of a keyboard. From CDs to iPods, internet downloads, or playing the hymns at church, music and electricity have been partners for over 120 years. Stephen Carroll of Wheeling plays to the congregation of the New Life United Methodist Church every Sunday on a virtual pipe organ he built. This idea started a couple of years ago with just one keyboard at my house and uh, sampler software where you can play pipe organ sounds with a keyboard at your house. So I got to thinking, why couldn't you design something that would be like a pipe organ to use in the church? And we've called it virtual pipe organ because it's not really a pipe organ, it's virtual. I want to say this was a Hammond organ. Uh, we gutted everything inside and out and that took about a week to get all the circuit boards and everything out of it and designed casing to hold two keyboards here. We cut a hole in here for a CD-ROM drive. The monitor is touchscreen, so when you touch any buttons on the screen, they respond. Uh, all the computer components, the hard drive, and everything is back inside of here. I think this is the wave of the future for the church. It's only been within the last two or three years that I've uh, been able to get samples for computer libraries. And those are actual recordings of real instruments that you can play. So that really increased the quality a lot. That makes it sound a lot more realistic. I've been trying to create as realistic an orchestra sound as I can through computers. I decided to try to explore emotions in music. So I sat down and started to write a symphony. It's just symphony number one. It's, it was based on a trip to the ocean. If it wasn't for technology, I would have to write all of this music out by hand and take it to a real orchestra and have them play it. Um, I've never been one to write music down. I just play it as I hear it and go with it. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't be able to do that without technology. Just hit record and start playing. I found an electronic community all over the place. Anytime you go online, uh, there are forums for people who write their own music. And I found there are a lot of people out there doing the same types of music that I'm doing. The internet gives you the ability to spread that all over the world. 
Yeah. And uh, that if you were watching the video clip, uh, the house he's walking through, uh, the setup he has there, that's where we recorded uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about with Steve, which is classic tragic hero. Now, uh, I hesitate to even say this name because I felt I was so lacking when we did this project that I've been embarrassed by it for years, not because of Steve's work, but because of mine. Uh, but I really didn't talk to Steve again until 2006 when I moved back to Wheeling for a year after failing out here in Los Angeles. I'm back now, doing well now. Um, so I went back to Wheeling. We messaged each other on AIM and I went over to his parents' house, which, as I mentioned, was sort of one hill over from my parents' house, where I was staying when I got back to Wheeling. Uh, when I when I told Steve I'd been writing songs for the last couple of years, when I wasn't busy helping my friend Brett uh, be an actual performing musician out here in Los Angeles, uh, Steve was very excited. He was all about it. Um, we initially teamed up to record the four to five songs I felt I could play pretty decently that I'd written some covers, some originals. Uh, and the result was this album you see here uh, called That's Life. It, it, it's an EP uh, from a band we called Classic Tragic Hero. Uh, here's a little clip. And I'm embarrassed. Please uh, listen to the music that Steve played. Don't listen to my voice. I was a two pack a day smoker back then. I had a terrible voice. Uh, but here's a clip from the title track. That's Life. Hold on to your hate. Though it keep you sedated, I loved you, but you'll never be my wife. Let it go when you are soothed, when you have something to prove. Healing starts with ripping out the knife. Oh, well, that's mine. Uh, listening back to that, you know, it's not that my voice was bad necessarily or off key. It was just weak. And I think I think that was honestly because of the smoking. Uh, but I also wanted to share. Hi, with you guys, this is Bill. Sorry about that. I wanted to share with you guys uh, one of the few times we both appeared on the same mic together. And after we released our first album, That's Life, we got approached by a. Uh, a podcast called A Life of Play who wanted to use our song Another Day in the City as their theme song. And then they asked us to record a little promo. This was when podcasts were new at the time. So it was like, ooh, a podcaster. I can't believe it. It's a professional podcaster. Um, but uh, they got a hold of us and asked us if we would record a promo uh, that they could play during the show, which we did. And I'll play it for you now. Hi, this is Bill and Steve from Classic, Classic Tragic, Tragic Hero. Hero. You're listening to a Life of Play podcast where they like to play our music every now and then, so stay tuned. And check out our music at myspace.com slash classic tragic hero and stephencarroll.com. Boy, we're prohibited. Not valid in Alaska. Website may or may not contain viruses. Children 12 or older, please consult a physician before use. Website may not contain anything. We had a good time. We had a good time. Uh, trivia, though. I cribbed the band name Classic Tragic Hero uh, from the book... Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe. Uh, I first learned about the literary concept of a classic tragic hero, uh, someone who uh, has the potential to be a hero, but has one fatal flaw holding them back. And uh, I, so I love the book when I read it in English 10 honors at Wheeling Park High School. So when it came time to do the band name, at that point, I was really down on myself because I had just kind of failed in Los Angeles. I had gotten out of a really long-term relationship a few months before that. And I was just feeling like a failure all, all around. And I felt like I had some sort of fatal flaw that if I could just identify it, that, uh, that it would be okay. And uh, so when it came time to do the band with Steve, I was like, let's call it classic tragic hero, just like uh, the main character from Things Fall Apart. I seemed fitting anyway. All right, let's see here. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to get through here, guys. Uh, I, if I do get emotional, I do apologize. Um, so around the same time we were doing all this stuff with Classic Tragic Hero and recording that That's Life album, uh, there was some fly-by-night website called YouTube.com uh, that sort of took off in the zeitgeist. Uh, you might have heard of it. Um, 
And a big part of the reason it took off like it did was because of a white boy rap video uh, that SNL put out called Lazy Sunday with Andy Samberg and Chris Parnell. It was a viral sensation. And so we decided to ride the wave. So I put together this medley of uh, some of my favorite rap songs from uh, Warren G, Warren G's Regulate, Bare Naked Ladies One Week, and a little bit of Gorilla's Clint Eastwood thrown in. Oh, and Ice Ice Baby. Um, it kind of mashed them all together and did a medley of them. Uh, we originally, I will say, uh, it's been renamed on the Classic Tragic Hero channel, channel, which I will have a link to in the show notes. It's been renamed a Classic Tragic Medley because White Boy Rap, I don't know, it doesn't feel like a very 2022 <laughs> title. So I, I wanted to change the title real quick. Uh, we also, um, for White Boy Rap, we shot and released a music video, which ended up being a huge hit on YouTube. Uh, so uh, I, I do want to, again, apologize for my voice. I was a two-pack-a-day smoker back then. My voice is actually much better now, as you'll hear later. Uh, but here, I'll go ahead and play a little bit of uh, what was once the White Boy Rap and is now the classic tragic medley. Yes, that did actually happen. That did actually happen. And you would be right to assume that no one ever heard of it ever again, which would be true, except right after we posted it, because YouTube was so young and there wasn't a lot of content on there. It actually did really well, um, especially for YouTube back then. Uh, as of today, um, December 30th, 2022, uh, the classic tragic medley video has uh, 121,000 views on YouTube. Now, granted, about 100,000 of those happened all back then in 2006, and then <laughs> the other 20,000 or so have been since then. But it's still, uh, you know, a point of pride to me that I had a number one music video on YouTube in the first six months of YouTube being a thing. Uh, so, you know, bragging rights. And, you know, Steve obviously sh shared those bragging rights, too. Uh, now, we did our second album uh, about six months later. Um, it was a little underbaked, a little undercooked. Uh, it was called Journey. It, basically, because white boy rap slash the classic tragic medley kind of blew up. We were like, okay, we got to get new stuff out right away. So I went and I wrote, I think, 10 songs, maybe. Uh, some of them were good. Some of them really sucked. Uh, but not, again, not Steve's fault, my fault, um, because I was partying hard back then and I wrote them all really quick and excuses, excuses, excuses. I still like a couple of the songs. Um, I, I, I like the cover, too, because you'll see it has the hero's journey outlined as subway stops along a subway map. You know, so, you know, so call to adventure, refusal, threshold, whale's belly, uh, trial road, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All adding up to a classic tragic hero's journey. Uh, yeah. And again, uh, you know, as far as where I was at the time, I I was doing a lot of drinking. I was really depressed because of the relationship and the failing in LA and everything. But that's all kind of me stuff. And any flaws you hear in the songs from Journey are not because of Steve. They're because of me. Um, so uh, 
in support of Journey, and because the white boy rap video kind of took off like it did, we decided to do another video for a song off Journey called My Baby True. And I'm going to play a little bit of that for you right now. And that was such a fun video to shoot, too. I shot that with my friends Ryan Board and Gretchen Snyder, uh, who, if you've watched The Fakest, you might know her as the voice of Cindy McNeil. But we basically spent about a month, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, something like that, <clears throat> running around Wheeling, West Virginia, shooting all these pop culture parodies. Like, I think you saw Little Shop of Horrors in there, Charlie Brown, uh, WB sh or CW shows back then, uh, you know, the elective detectives. Uh, it, it was a whole lot of fun. There, there is some drama, uh, behind that video and that whole thing. Uh, but I think I'll save that story for another day. All right. Uh, so a lot of times, um, you know, I go over for a recording session at Steve's to do some classic tragic hero music and he would have put together this, he, like the next morning he would email me and he would have put together this crazy sketch from all my outtakes um i picked my there were several of them i still have uh, i picked my favorite one though and this one's called bill and steve order pizzas hi this is bill and steve and we're from classic tragic hero we'd like to order an extra large pizza with uh what did you say you wanted extra garlic that was way off oh i'm sorry he said he wanted anchovies that was that was off too all right just make it pepperoni then is that okay something like that Great. You need anything else? I need a drink. We got stuff to drink here. I'm not paying them 10 bucks to deliver a bottle of Coke. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, whatever. You want anything else? Okay. Uh, actually, it'll, it'll be... What? I forgot the right words. Listen closely when I ask this question. Do you want anything else? Oh, wait, no. Okay, that's all we need. Just deliver the pizza. The address is 2218... Sansom Street. <laughs> On Sansom Street. Yes, Bill, that is where I live. I'm glad you know that. On Sansom Street. I gotta go. <laughs> he would always send these to me at like three o'clock in the morning, too. I don't know why he was up that late doing silly shit like that, but I always appreciated it. <laughs> Um, I, I actually I debated throwing more of those in here, but I was like, you know what? This is probably the strongest one, the best one. We'll leave it at that. Sansom Street, by the way, was a song off the album Journey. OK, so eventually our uh, local and Internet notoriety um, earned us a gig at yesterday's the hippest club in Wheeling at the time. Not that that's saying a lot because, I mean, it is Wheeling, West Virginia. So, I mean, even the hippest club isn't all that hip, right? Um, they usually catered to punk bands and uh, death metal, thrash metal kind of bands. But I hope Steve's piano skills uh, and our folk punk attitude uh, would win over the crowd at yesterday's. Um, it was like, I do this all the time in my life. I'm like, okay, let's, we're running, we're running, we're good. Let's put on ankle weights and see how that goes. Let's go and do folk punk at a uh, rock club and see what happens. So I was really excited about it. Uh, Steve seemed to be really excited about it. But at the end of the day, one of the things I remember most about Steve is he he hated the spotlight. He, ha he hated, uh, he would go up in front of a church and play for hundreds of people, but he'd be, you know, behind the organ or behind the piano. He was very hesitant to even, uh, you saw a picture from the 
Journey album interior cover. And he was very hesitant to even send me that picture. Um, he just, he liked to be a behind the scenes guy, which I, I realized. And, you know, as we moved on with different creative projects, he became more of a behind the scenes guy today. I'm putting him out on front street. Um, so because Steve was so nervous and everything, he didn't show up, uh, for our big gig at yesterday's. Uh, so that kind of hurt me. Right. Because we had been building this thing for like six, seven, eight months at that point. And then we finally get this big opportunity to, you know, actually start playing gigs and wheeling, at least. And he he kind of ghosted me, I guess you would say, in today's parlance. It, it did hurt. Uh, but I again, it's all water under the bridge these days. And I'll get into more detail on that as we go on. But it hurt at the time. And so I kind of stopped talking to Steve for a while. Uh, and then soon after the gig, I ended up reconnecting with an old college friend, uh, Anne-Marie De Simone, uh, who is now my wife. Uh, so I found myself sort of with requited love to write about where all the classic tragic hero stuff up to that point had been about unrequited love. My love had been requited. So maybe the point of classic tragic hero was, wasn't really there anymore, right? Uh, so I moved to Pittsburgh uh, to be with Anne-Marie. I moved away from Wheeling and kind of left everything behind to go off to my new life. Um, and this all happened within a couple months of us starting to date. Uh, so, um, a few months later after, uh, we got settled, uh, Steve messaged me, uh, apologized for not showing up to the gig and asked if I wanted to work on some new stuff. Now I was a new dad at that point, living in Cleveland at that point, uh, struggling to find employment at that point, but I was still all about working with Steve. I've always loved working with Steve. We've always had like this shorthand between us. So I was like, yes, let's do it. I, and we worked up a few new songs, including one called Classic Tragic Heroes, you know, like the name of the band. Uh, but with fatherhood on my end and Steve finding the love of his life, Amy, it never really went anywhere. Where? And that's a, if you look over there, uh, you'll see a picture of Steve and his wife, Amy, um, who got married, like I said, about two years after we stopped doing the Classic Tragic hero stuff. All right. Well, um, I am going to say that, uh, you know, this is a, a sponsored podcast. It feels really weird to do a sponsor read during this, but I am going to let you know a little bit about Stream Studio, and uh, then we'll be right back to talk more about Steve and his studio. <laughs> Thanks. Where I'm From is brought to you by Stream Studio. That's S-T-R-E-A-N-N -N Studio. The web app that puts you in charge of the live show. Stream Studio allows you to take your streaming game to the next level by allowing you to stream to multiple platforms at once. If you want to go to Twitch, if you want to go to YouTube, you can stream to all of those platforms at once, get feedback from your audience, and most importantly, it puts you in control of the show. Now, Stream Studio has several packages that work for just about any type of broadcaster. From the free plan, where you can stream with a watermark, all the way up to the gold plan, where you can have up to eight guests. You can stream to as many social platforms as you want. You can get a web link to share your show with external audiences. And you can even get an iframe so you can embed your live stream show directly into your website. Hey, I love Stream Studio so much, I'm using it to produce this show. I want to thank Stream Studio for supporting where I'm from. And you can give this fantastic software spin and support where I'm from at the same time. Just head over to our website at billmeeks.com slash where I'm from and click on the Stream Studio banner so they know we sent you their way. And we want to thank Stream Studio for sponsoring uh, this episode of Where I'm From, a very special episode of Where I'm From. So, you know, like I said, uh, me and Steve, over the years, we, we didn't quite connect on classic tragic hero at that point, although we were always trying to. But I kind of went off and became a freelance video producer where I would make uh, advertisements and uh, explainer videos, all sorts of stuff like that for various internet startups. One of them 
I was lucky enough to find an opportunity to bring Steve on for. Uh, there's a podcast out there that's still going on called Sword and Laser with Tom Merritt and Veronica Belmont. And uh, back in, I think, 2005 or no, uh, 2010, something like 2008, somewhere in the late 2000s or, yeah, the late aughts, uh, they got picked up as a video YouTube show on Felicia Day's YouTube channel, Geek and Sundry. So I knew Tom from various uh, things. Like I was a big, uh, constantly in the chat room over on This Week in Tech, Net Tech Network where he worked. And so he reached out to me to see if I wanted to do the animation for him. He didn't explain necessarily that they already had a theme song they were a thousand percent happy with and wanted to use for the TV show. So I reached out to Steve about putting together a theme song for the show. I asked him if he wanted to, uh, I thought it would be a fun idea to base the music off of an uh, 80s show called CBS Story Brick, which was an anthology show that would do uh, adaptations of various uh, junior high school kid novels, like How to Eat Fried Worms is one that pops into mind. But I always love like this big epic opening they had. So I was like, you know, that would be good for Sword and Laser too. So here for the first time, I'm going to play you what ended up becoming the intro for the show with the original music I had, I commissioned Steve to write it for. You might find this a little familiar. We'll see. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Sword and Laser Show. I'm Veronica Belmont. And I'm Tom Merritt. And uh, if you followed any of my work at all, you probably recognized that song that was being played as the theme song to Greetings from Storybrooke, a Once Upon a Time podcast that I did with uh, my wife, Anne-Marie De Simone, for a number of years. Um, I, so I, bleh, 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 this is all going to stay in. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we started off Greetings from Storybrooke. And uh, Steve's theme opened and closed over 200 episodes downloaded by tens of thousands of listeners uh, over the course of the years where we're doing Greetings from Storybrooke. It was a fan cast focused on the ABC TV show Once Upon a Time set in a, count, a town called Storybrooke. So I thought um, Steve's take on the CBS Story Break inspired theme fit the bill. <clears throat> Plus, Steve had already made it, and I felt bad I couldn't use it in a more high-profile project. Uh, the theme song worked great, though, and it often got compliments from listeners. I probably should have forwarded more of those compliments on to Steve, uh, but I, th I think he knows how appreciated it was. <laughs> Greetings from Storybrooke. I'm Bill Meeks. And I'm Anne-Marie De Simone. And Anne-Marie, we are here for a very special episode today. We're going to have a very special episode. A very special we have some episode. serious topics to talk about tonight. Yes, I... I oh, wait a second. Where did Anne-Marie go? It, it's the masked woman with the fairy wand. I don't know. <laughs> I there don't... are too many props sitting here. I can't <laughs> resist. <laughs> no, but... Yeah, and if you'll... Notice that was my wife, Anne-Marie, who co-hosted the show with me. Also, if you're watching video, I'm currently wearing a Greetings from Storybrooke t-shirt. So huge, profound effect on my life. Uh, the clip that, or the episode that that clip is actually from is the episode where a company flew me out here to Los Angeles from where we were living in Atlanta to do a live version of Greetings from Storybrooke. So Steve's theme blasted out to a huge conference room filled with Once Upon a Time fans. Uh, I, I think I made sure to send him a note after that, being like, dude, your music got blasted out to the world. Um, so uh, after um, we got done with the fan podcasting stuff, because we, we, we added another one and another one, and they were even more successful than the Once Upon a Time one. And then... We ran out of time to do it. So we kind of folded things, but I wanted to keep doing podcasts. And I had always had an idea to do a comedy podcast, uh, some sort of sketch comedy podcast. And uh, so that pot idea 
became a show called The Fakest, reporting the fake news for real. Um, now, it's not very political. Um, I know fake news has a lot of um, a lot of cruft around it these days, but we ended up doing a fun comedy show called The Fakest. In this crazy mixed up world, you need fake news you can depend on. Fake count on. Laugh at. When news is breaking, it's probably the fakest. <laughs> it's probably the fakest that's breaking it. That's me. I'm Paul Defoe. We've got a commercial, Paul. Breaking the fake news for real. From KCOM Studios in somewhere west of New York City, this is The Fakest. And uh, Steve was very involved with The Fakest. He joined The Fakest team in our third episode uh, when he composed another silly rap uh, for, for my cast to perform. It was actually a really fun night because... <clears throat> Once we stopped doing greetings, we passed it off to some of our listeners. And then those listeners came to our house to watch the series finale and record a live reaction podcast with us, our, our house in Orlando, Florida. So while they were there, uh, I knew they were all going to be involved in the fakest as voice actors. So we recorded this next track that Steve did for us. It's, a, it's another rap, and it's all about the news team from the Fakus, their favorite place to go have lunch. It's called Madame Caprao's Lunch Place Wrap. Yeah, it's your boy Birdman staying here, coming to you from the underground. About to spit fire. Rolling down the street with our boy Birdman stand. All our rap, Thai food, as fast as we can. Our, our old, old lunch place, place doesn't have the same fire. fire. Who knew I learned to love these salads with, with papaya? papaya. Yeah, and I'll say that The Fakest was uh, definitely a project that really let us stretch our creative wings as a creative partnership, uh, the creative partnership we had over the years. Uh, I'm going to go through some of my favorite examples now. Um, first up, I want to go show you this one. It's uh, basically in the first season of The Fakest, Mr. Rogers, as a character, gets revived by a weird voodoo spell by these Twitch streamers to kind of help them get subscribers. I know, it's weird. But I had Steve record a suite of piano music that was in the that jazz style, plinky plink style of Mr. Rogers. And I'll play a clip of that in that story for you now. When asked about mounting criticisms from the quadrennial set, Mr. Rogers was taken aback. Children today can be so mean. Making fun of how somebody looks? It's never okay to make fun of somebody for something they can't control. It's like they didn't hear a word I said. It might feel like the world's ending, but it's not. And even if it was, we need to show that we're brave. You can't be brave if you're inside out, worried about every little thing there is to worry about. You miss the big bad things. And those big bad things, they show you just how brave you really are. My mother used to tell me a long time ago, whenever there was a big catastrophe or something really scary on the news, she would tell me to look for the helpers. And if the news about the president makes you sad or angry, remember that he has helpers like me looking after him. I hope that helps you to be brave. Other people already know you're brave. You just need to show it. And that's the amenable Bobby Hawk as Mr. Rogers in that clip. Uh, Bobby from Bradenton. Love you, Bobby. Uh, next up. OK, so in the second season, Paul goes through a crisis where he thinks he's got what he wants, but then he realizes it's not what he needs. And this was a major theme throughout all of the fakest. One of my favorite pop songs to kind of deal with this theme was a song called By the New Radicals called You Get What You Give. So it became sort of a motif throughout the season. Um, we did a few different pieces with it uh, that I'm going to play for you now. One of them is a story where one of the reporters for the fake is goes to interview the former lead singer of the New Radicals. And uh, then there are, I have some other uh, versions that we did in there. And then I have a karaoke track that Paul sings at the end of the season. Again, the reason... Um, well, the new radical song, You Get What You Give, in a lot of ways, is about 
this band who's been working hard for years and years and years and finally gets to the point where they're playing with uh, Marilyn Manson and Courtney Love and all these people. And then they realize it's not what they want. So uh, here, uh, now I'll go ahead and play for you the You Get What You Give Sweet. First up, a 90s pop idol resurfaces after years out of the public eye. Greg Alexander, 47, formerly of the one-hit sensation New Radicals, resurfaces tonight in the new Flicks documentary Flagpole Sitta, Falling from Grace, about one-hit wonders specifically from the years 1997 to 2001. When I found Greg Alexander, he was wandering the woods of Ableton, Kentucky, searching for squirrels to feed his four growing boys. Sometimes I come out here and think about those three weeks where we're in the top 10 on TRL. They even had us in studio once. It was surreal. Hold on. But yeah, this goes out to a dear, dear friend. Fly high, buddy. Fly high. Hey, kill Birdman, stay. Wake up, kids, we've got the dreamer's disease. Age 14, they've got you down on your knees. So polite, you're busy still saying please. Oh, why would you do that? It's a unique show. It's a unique show, The Fakest. Uh, if you want to check it out, uh, thefakest.com. <clears throat> but... You know, as I said, Steve continued to do work for me on The Fakest through all three seasons. Uh, the next one I want to share with you is another karaoke track. Um, that karaoke track, the You Get What You Give karaoke track, I just did the song because it fit thematically perfectly. Uh, this one uh, for season two, season two, episode eight, I decided to do a parody uh, track. Uh, it's a parody of, um, oh, what is it? Um, yeah, nobody knows it but, but me. By is it Brian McKnight? Maybe, but uh, I'll go. But it's a really low point right at the end of the season. Paul's kind of lost everything. He's realized all the fighting they've been doing all season was for nothing, and then he goes to the karaoke bar again. Okay, folks, last karaoke artist of the night, straight from his hit fake news program, The Fakest, Mister Paul Defoe. Hey, here you go, Grimace. <laughs> this one is going out to my dad, Janitor Jim, and my news team. Sorry if I let all of you down, as usual. <sighs> I'll pretend I'm glad I'm going away. My smile's fading more every day. My show's dying tonight. And nobody knows it but me. Like a clown, I put on a show. The pain is real, even if our viewers don't know. Usually, and I'm crying inside. But nobody knows it but me. Thank you for dealing with my warbling. Um, it, it was a character voice. It was a character voice. Um, next up, we did uh, probably the episode I'm most proud of out of all of the episodes of The Fakest, the totally original Fakest Christmas special. And Steve, because he's a very talented keyboardist, just so happened to have a collection of about nine or ten Christmas carols sitting around that he sent me to use for him. So I'm going to play you a, a little clip with some of those for you now. My bungalow. I'm back. Finally. Now, to drink away all those recently remembered memories. Let me just grab a clean glass off the shelf here. There. <laughs> Now, let's watch some TV, why not? I wonder what KCOM is airing right now. Woo! Yeah! Woo! I can't believe this is happening! Woo! Woo! Where are we going now? 
to right now, of course. The last spirit had your entire backstory to mine from. I only get this one night. Let's see how the other members of the news team are getting on without you. <laughs> okay, it's a Christmas carol. We totally did a Christmas carol. And that's fine. Uh, that story has been covered by the Flintstones. So I think we're good. I uh, know, but a really fun special. And Steve's Christmas music really made it like a... I believe there's one review on The Fakest that specifically cites the music in combination with Rebecca Johnson's performance in one of the last scenes as making them cry, as inspiring real actual tears, which, you know, as an artist, as a writer, is something that you aspire to. You want to make people cry because it, it makes you feel better about crying. <laughs> um, okay, and uh, I think I think this is the last piece... Yeah, this is the last piece I want to share with you guys from The Fakest. Uh, the last season of The Fakest, we sort of uh, rebranded, re did a soft re reboot, and it's called The Fakest One Last Day. Now, you remember that karaoke uh, track that Paul was really broken up about betraying the news team? The last season, The Fakest One Last Day, is all about the results of that and how the fake news falls finally forever. Um, but I, Steve collaborated with someone we both went to high school with, this guy named Joe Carr, who lives in Wheeling. Uh, Joe pl sang the song because my voice kind of sucks and I didn't want to do it. And uh, he played the guitar and I sent those tracks to Steve and he put together this whole arrangement. This is a, uh, a parody of The Times They Are Changing by Bob Dylan. I, I think you'll detect that when we go through, but here we go. Maybe. I don't have to tell you guys that things are bad, but I think if we kick names and take ass tonight, we might just be able to save the show. Turn on your TVs, honey, let's go. Let's watch the fake news team and that jerk part the foe. They only have one day to save the show. There's a fake news worth saving. They'll fight really hard, but it'll still blow. For the fakest new show is a fade in. For the fakest new show is a fade Now we arrive at the day in question, December 13th, 2021. One last day to save the show. One last day. A standalone story set in the world of the fakes. Starting March 3rd on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and, well everywhere else also still available everywhere else <laughs> um steve did a lot more music than just those few tracks i selected but those were the ones that were <clears throat> some of my favorites over the years but we had a lot of plans we were going to do so much more in me and steve um for one i've spent about two years during the pandemic writing a series of i think if there's eight or nine tv pilots and movie scripts all set in a world that's based on the town where we grew up uh, called Everly Heights. Uh, Everly Heights, home of the arts. And uh, we had been talking back over the summer after I was like, okay, we're going to push forward with this project. This is the new fakest, you know, project. Um, and Steve was really excited about it. We were getting ready to get a meeting together with me and Steve and my friend Tom Gerke, who does my art for me. And uh, then I got a gig. I got a podcast produ producer gig, which, you know, is great because, you know, money's nice and, you know, paying your rent's nice and everything. But at the same time, I had to put Everly Heights on the back burner. And unfortunately, that means Steve can't be involved now. Uh, he had so many ideas uh, when I approached him with the concept. Uh, he was talking about different musical styles he wanted to work in. He was talking about different motifs he wanted to work in throughout all of the different properties. Because each one of these scripts is a different story about different characters, for the most part, all set in one town at really height. So he had ideas out the wazoo for this. And honestly, like one of my biggest regrets of the past few years is not pushing forward uh, while I had the chance. Uh so Steve could be involved with this because this project, it's so tied into Wheeling, West Virginia, where we grew up and I met him. And yeah, I think his creative voice would have been great on it. 
Um, <clears throat> but now I guess, uh, I guess I have to push it forward with it without Steve, which is unfortunate, but I want to do it for Steve because he was really excited about it. And I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to work on it. Um, I, I will say too that <clears throat> there are a couple characters in Everly Heights that are also based on friends I lost way too soon. Brett Kane, uh, who I mentioned before, the musician that I tooled around with out here in LA, and Ryan Horde, who was the guy who taught me how to play the guitar and encouraged me to keep writing songs that led to classic Tragic Hero. That collection of songs, I wouldn't have written them <clears throat> if it hadn't been for Ryan Horde. I, at some point, I'll probably end up doing another special like this on those guys, because both of those guys, much like Steve, huge influences throughout my entire life uh, for 20 years now. I have been important people that anytime I want to do anything, I go talk to these people before I do it creatively, before I do anything creatively. Obviously, if I go to brush my teeth, I wasn't calling up Brett or Steve or Ryan. But uh, if you guys like this episode, let me know, Bill at BillMeeks.com. I'd love to do another special on Brett, who was a super talented musician, singer, songwriter, and Ryan, again, another super talented singer, songwriter. The stuff... <clears throat> I did for Classic Tragic Hero, I wish was half as good as anything they did on their worst day. And if Steve's contribution did anything, it was that he made me look better than I was. Uh, so thanks for that, Steve. Um, all right. So I want to close this out here with, I have one final Classic Tragic Hero song that has never been released. Last summer, Steve sent me this track, and it's a song he wrote a few years back. But it was the first time he ever approached me with a song for Classic Tragic Hero. He had the instrumentation all done. He just wanted me to cut the vocal track because he hated his voice. Um, and it's called In the Long Run. And it's, it's really about someone sort of reaching the end of their, their life. Um, and at first, uh, when he sent it to me, I was, I was a little worried, but then I... I touched base with him and it wasn't anything reflective of where he was mentally at the time. So I was like, okay, well, we'll get to it. And again, same thing has happened with Everly Heights. Uh, I got the podcasting gig. I started doing this show, which, you know, thank you stream studio for sponsoring this show and allowing me to do it. Uh, but it takes up a fair amount of time and I didn't have quite time for my indie projects as I did before these gigs uh so steve sent this song to me i want to share it with you guys as well as one uh cover song from his youtube channel uh that i think you guys will really really enjoy you might have heard a little bit of it up top too uh but with i'm gonna toss to the song in a minute sorry i'm getting a little emotional here but i want to thank you guys for joining me for this 2022 season one of where i'm from I'm going to be back in the new year with plenty of new people, probably a bit more cheery than this, although I've tried to keep it as lighthearted as I can, considering my heart's still a little broken about everything. Um, but yeah, uh, please come back in the new year. Uh, we're going to have season two, starting with Dave Thune, a great comedic actor here in Los Angeles. And we're going to keep rolling through the months, uh, talking to people about where they're from. Uh, you can find links to all the places you can subscribe to the podcast over at billmeeks.com slash where I'm from, all one word. Uh, I think that about does it. Oh, I also wanted to say, if you knew Steve and uh, like Jason uh, did, if you want to share a memory, I'd love to, I have a feedback section on this show. I'd love to keep talking about Steve for as long as people keep talking to me about Steve. Uh, so feel free to shoot me an email with your Steve memories, if you have them, bill at billmeeks.com. Um, I think that's about it. So this is going to be the next to last classic Tragic Hero song um, that I'm playing in the long run by Steve Carroll. I'm going to post it over on that channel as soon as I'm done with the show and everything. And uh, then after that, we're going to end the show with 
uh, the orchestral connection, a fun orchestral cover of the Rainbow Connection. Uh, I want to thank you guys again so much for joining me on this very personal episode of where I'm from to close out the season. And we'll see you in 2023. for so long Your past is gone You're almost through You've paid the price You've sung your song There's not much left for you to do So go ahead, sit back and cry And hope they'll miss you when you're gone You're feeling old, but is it all just in your mind? Could you fix it with a needle or a pill? Would it make any difference in the long run? You've run so far But there's a hole within your soul And you're about to lose control In the long run I was so young when I found you My life had only just begun Your memories were all that you knew Your best days you had outrun Thought I'd learn from your mistakes But in the end I shared that too You're feeling old But is it all just in your mind? Could you fix it with a needle or a pen? Would it make any difference in the long run? You've run so far But there's a hole within your soul And you're about to lose control in the long run You ran the race, you kept the faith, but the whole world changed along the way while you stood still. Looking back to yesterday, you gave up the fight, you lost control, you put your hope in a pill and thought you'd never grow old. And now you're looking in the face of another lost soul. I'm feeling old, but is it all just in my mind? Could I fix it with a needle or a pill? Would it make any difference in the long run? I've run so far, but there's a hole within my soul. I'm about to lose control in the long run
Bye, Steve.